Would well, good morning to you all. That's as close as I get to Texas, right there. Y'all, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're here. Hey, we're here to study the Word of God. And we're kind of a different church in that we actually go through the Bible verse by verse, line upon line, expositing the Scripture, trying to get out of it what God wants us to hear, and then applying those things to our life. We just finished the book of Matthew. Remember Matthew, the theme is Jesus is the coming king. He's the king that is coming to establish his kingdom. Well, now we're in the book of Romans. And the theme of Romans is the just shall live by faith. The theme verse is Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So that is the theme verse and the theme of Romans. And we're going to spend some time in the book of Romans. I imagine this will be several years as we go through this. Maybe the rapture will come and we won't finish the book of Romans. Yes, yes, that's what we're hoping for. So we have two verses today and we have an introduction. And in an introduction, I'll talk a lot about Paul, his missionary journeys his calling on the Damascus Road, how he went from a killer of Christians to a Christian himself and the greatest missionary in the history of the world. So stand as we read just two verses today in Romans chapter 1. We honor God by standing when we read his word. This is precious to us. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is the Word of God. Our Father, we give you thanks for this time that you have allowed us to carve time out of our busy lives to study the Word of God together corporately. There's something wonderful about the body meeting together and worshiping our God in song and in word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you teach us today things that you want us to know. May we set aside the world for just a few moments all the troubles, all the stuff that comes into our lives and focus on what you have. May we be overwhelmed by your spirit today as he touches our hearts, our minds, our beings, and we are moved by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So the author, of course, is Paul, but actually he had a guy that wrote it down for me. He had a, a scribe, his name is Tertius. And in Romans 16, 22, I, Tertius, who wrote this great epistle, greet you in the Lord. Now, when you think epistle, when we say epistle, think letter. These are letters that went to the church. There's 21 epistles in the New Testament. 13 were written by Paul. Now, Paul wrote these mostly when he went on his missionary journeys. Now, this is an Andy Wood slide. And it'll come up on the screen, and it's going to show you how you can remember these 13 books. So, oh, goody, 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 yes. <laughs> I don't know that people will, but I have tried to remember this. So on his first missionary journey, he wrote to the Galatians. Uh, and that's one book. First, one. Second missionary journey, two books. First and second Thessalonians. Third missionary journey, how many books? Three books, yes, three books. So he wrote Romans and First and Second Corinthians. On his fourth missionary journey, it's, it's, sometimes it's not considered an official missionary journey, but it really was. It was his trip from Jerusalem to Rome where he was in house arrest, and there he wrote the prison epistles, and I have them PCE in my mind. So Philippians, Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians. He was released from Roman custody after two years because no one came and brought an accusation against him. And he wrote two more books, 1 Timothy and Titus. And then just before his death, he's imprisoned in the Mamertine prison. I'll mention this several times. And he wrote 2 Timothy, where he has fought the good fight. He has finished the race. He has kept the faith. So the book is written to the Romans. His purpose, I don't know if you know this or not, but Paul really wanted to evangelize Spain, and he needed a base to work from, so he chose that place to be Rome, but he never really, it's not written that he got to Spain, but he desired it. In Romans 15, 24, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. Now look at, like Paul, sometimes our plans don't work out exactly like we planned. God has different plans for us. Always be ready to adjust your life. And again, he was in a rented house for two years, 
where he was under house arrest with a Roman guard. But five to six years later, it was a whole different program. He had people coming and going while he was in, in his first imprisonment. He could minister to them. It says here in Acts 28.30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house, received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Listen to this. And no, for, no one forbidding him. He had an open door to minister to people as they came to him, but he could not go into Rome proper. He was under house arrest. It was quite different five or six years later when Nero persecution started. Remember, Nero burned down Rome, some of its older districts. And they blamed, he blamed the Christians. And then Paul was rounded up with other Christians to be slaughtered by Nero. Nero was caught up in Roman persecution. While he was in chains in the Mamertine prison, in 2 Timothy 2.9 says he was in chains. In 4.13, he was in a cold cell, wet, abandoned by all of his friends, and then he sends for Timothy, which is kind of ironic because Timothy was timid. Remember, Timothy, timid Timothy. And yet Timothy is going to bring the parchments, bring the books, bring the things that I need to read to uplift my spirit. He's in this cell ready to die, and he wants the Word of God to go to, to enrich him as he's going through this final experience. He says, bring the cloak, by the way, because it's cold in here, Timothy. Bring the cloak. Unlike Paul's other epistles, that which were all the correct aberrant theology. When you read First and Second Corinthians, aberrant theology. When you read some of these other books, aberrant theology. But Romans is different. It gives us a, the greatest treatise in the Scripture about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's broken up into six areas. Actually, I have six areas that I think of. This one's a little bit different, but it's close to the way that I look at this. It starts out. This one says on the overhead, it'll say a summary and introduction. I think that's correct. But I want you to remember the S's, six S's as we go through this teaching over the years. It's how long we're going to be in this. <laughs> Sin, salvation, sanctification, sovereignty, service of God. And then he finally gives a so long or a farewell as the last part of the book of Romans. What you want to remember about Paul was he was a pedigree Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee. That means he was zealous for the law, zealous for God. You do things this way or you get chopped down by the Pharisees. He was a religious, self-righteous zealot. He was under the teaching of Gamaliel, who was one of the great teachers of that time. Paul hated Christians. He did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And he persecuted with fervor many Christians. I don't know if he directly murdered Christians. I suspect he did. But if not murdered, he was directly involved with their death. So he was a murderer in that sense. John MacArthur makes an interesting statement about Romans, excuse me, Acts 8.3. Saul made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women committing them to prison. He has this to say about the word made, words made havoc. Made havoc. He says this, in extra biblical writings to refer to the destruction of a city or mangling by a wild animal. Saul was in to the destruction of Christians, much like you see today. I don't know if you've read the news lately, but in Nigeria, the Christian church there is suffering like no other place on earth right now. They are being slaughtered by radical Muslims. It's happening all over. They hate Christians. This world hates Christians. Paul hated Christians until the Damascus Road. Now, I have a map here that's going to come up. Paul was going from Jerusalem to Damascus. This is quite a trip, 134 miles. And he wanted to kill. He wanted to take these people back, put them in chains, and get rid of these Christians. Seeking to arrest more Jews in verses 1 and 2 of Acts 9. In 3 and 9, he runs into Jesus. We're going to go through these verses most shortly. And then he visits, visited by Ananias, who reluctantly leads Paul to Christ. Okay? So that's the setup. That's the setup. So, Acts chapter 9, 
you might want to turn there. I'm going to go through some of these verses. I'm not going to exegete them exactly and precisely like we normally do, but for time, we'll just go through this rather quickly. Then Saul, verses 1 and 2, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. I mean, he, he engendered immense fear in the Christian community. He was a killer, and he wanted the Christians killed. Went to the high priest, asked for letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He wants to get rid of them. Now, in the process of this 134-mile walk that he's taking, he runs in to Jesus. And I'm telling you, his life is changed. In verse 3 and 4 of Acts chapter 9, suddenly, isn't it amazing how God just comes into your life? Just suddenly, your life has changed. A light shone around him from heaven. He fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I want you to take a hard stop right here. Any time Christians are persecuted is a direct assault on Jesus Christ himself. Folks, you've been born again. You're in the family of God. God looks at you as his children, and you are directly attacking him when you attack the children of God. It's a serious thing. Then we have these words. Listen to the dialogue in verse 5 and 6. Paul says, when this resplendent light comes on him, he says these words, Who are you, Lord, with concern? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul responds, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want from me? And then Jesus gives him instructions. That's a message for every believer here today, for every person in this world. Lord, what do you want from me? And for Paul, it was to be saved and then be the greatest missionary in the history of the world. For you, you have your mission. It might not to be a Paul, but you put your name there. You have a mission that God has given you to perform within this world. He says, arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what to do. An interesting addition to this is in verse 7. The men who journeyed with him stood speechless. I imagine terrified hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Paul was blinded by the light of Christ. Now, we know that light, and we identify that light as the Shekinah glory of God. Now, we know that Shekinah comes from the word Shekin, which means tabernacles, when God tabernacles with mankind. He appears in three forms. Fire, cloud, light. Remember in the Egyptian wilderness, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night, and then resplendent light, resplendent light. Jesus, being the light of the world, came into this world to displace the darkness. Light. Enter Ananias, a disciple of Jesus. He has a vision. He's supposed to seek out Saul of Tarsus. And this is kind of an uh-oh moment for Ananias because he doesn't want to go and introduce himself to Saul. He knows that this guy is a murderer and a killer. But Jesus responds to Ananias, Go, for he, in verse 15 and 16, For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must, oh, listen to this, suffer for my name's sake. Now take just a pause moment here. Paul is getting a heads up that you're going to suffer for being a Christian. Now, how many people receive that message today in the church? Nobody wants to suffer. No one wants to sacrifice anything. If the least bit of persecution comes, we're flying to a safe place. What wasn't the way with Saul? There's persecution throughout this world today that is unimaginable. It's more than any time in the history of the world Christians are being persecuted in greater numbers, more violently. And that's a, that's a big thing to say, but it is happening today. Ananias is very concerned, but he obeys. In verse 17 and 18, laying his hands on him, he must have been a little bit fearful, a little bit trepidant here, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight. He was blinded for three days. Now, this must be an exhilarating moment when he can see again. 
and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is salvation, folks. This is when Paul got saved. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And again, this is Paul's salvation experience. His life was changed in an instant. Devoted to God from a God killer to a God server. A hater of Jesus to a believer in Jesus. Folks, changed by God. Every single person that comes into the family of God is changed by God. He never leaves you to stay the same. He always calls you to change. If anyone's in Christ, what is he? He's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. That's right. It's a new you being conformed to the likeness of Christ. So Paul's had his salvation experience. Then he goes on to be the greatest missionary in the history of the world. He went on at least the first three missionary journeys. I had maps I was going to show you, and this is the city, and you would never remember in a million years the map. I mean, I'm telling you, I can look at it, and, and two hours later, I have not a clue what I've looked at. So I, I know this, so I didn't put that up. But I want you to realize on these missionary journeys is where Paul suffered. This is when he had the beatings, the rods. Remember, we talked about the, the stripes, the 39 stripes. It was 40 minus 1 because the Jews didn't want to break the law. And he had the rods, whatever that was. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked three times. He spent a day and a night in the water. Remember in 2 Corinthians, we went through this last week. And then it went through the perils that he went through, the perils. I mean, you talk about suffering. Jesus said he's going to suffer. The perils of water, the perils of Gentile cities, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils of weariness, toil and cold and naked, etc. He just went on and on. You're going, my goodness, Paul. Paul knew misery, yet Paul endured. And guess what? He never quit. And I hope that can be something that's that's stamped on your life. I didn't quit. I didn't give up when the going got tough. And by the way, the going gets tough for every single human in this world. Do not give up. This, we're not home yet. We're in foreign territory. We're in enemy territory. It'll all be heaven. People often say, why does God allow evil? He's a mean God. He allows evil. Look, sin brought evil into the world. Satan sinned. Adam and Eve sinned. That sin curse was passed on to each one of us. We sin. We're separated from God. Experience this mess that we have here today because of sin. God created it all perfect. Perfect. And then we came in and chose to side with Satan. So he has these missionary journeys. He goes on three of them. And this fourth one, I believe, is also a missionary journey because he takes that, that prison ship from Jerusalem all the way over to Rome, and he has a shipwreck there, and he ministers to people. He gets bit by a snake. He has all these things happen to him. He's still a missionary. Paul was well-traveled. But listen to this, and I hope you can say this. Paul did not waste his life. He did not waste his life. He had no reserves. Remember William Borden in the back of his Bible had this written. Hopefully you do too. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. And hold nothing back, never step back, and finish your race with no regrets. May this be our legacy. Now, the introduction to Romans, verses 1 and 2. We're going to take some time talking about apostles and bondservants. So, bondservants and apostles separated to God. Verse 1 and 2, I will read it one more time. Paul a bondservant of Jesus Christ. What a precious thing to be a bondservant of the Lord Jesus. What an honor. Called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. An apostle, a bondservant. I want you to focus on the word called, because you were all called before you came into the family of God. You didn't just volunteer to come into this. God sought you. 
You were not seeking God. God sought you, drew you, convicted you, did something in your heart, took the blinders off and allows you to see the truth of who Jesus and who Christ really is. And he, that is why you got saved. You had to believe. You have the responsibility. Everything is laid out there for you, but you must believe. So he's called, which means invited, welcomed, or appointed. Paul was appointed to this mission. He was a bondservant. And we know that word. I've used it many, many times. A doulos. Why do I emphasize that? Because a bondservant or a slave makes you think of something terrible. But a doulos is this. My will is consumed with my master's will. Now, who is my master? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is our master. Now, the word apostle simply means sent ones. That's what the word apostolos it means sent ones. You must realize that there are two groups of apostles. There are apostles of Christ and there are apostles of the church. The apostles of the church are not the same as the apostles of Christ. To be an apostle of Christ, you had the original 12, then you had Matthias added, and then you had Paul. These are, these are the apostles of Christ. There's three criteria. I didn't put this on the screen. We've been through this before. But you had to be called by Jesus personally, confirmed by signs and wonders, and have seen the resurrected Jesus. All these guys that were apostles of Christ did this, had this ability. Jesus gave them this ability. It's very different with apostles of the church, which simply means sent one. Now, I want to talk to you about something that we've talked about before, but I do want to take some time with this. There is a segment of Christianity, and I believe that these, there are saved people in this, but I think they're misguided. It's called the New Apostolic Reformation. And they believe that God is doing a new thing raising up apostles and prophets authenticated by signs and wonders. And this, this, this sounds great, and it sounds terrific and wonderful, but I don't see this as what's actually happening. I don't see this congruent with the Word of God. The movement has stated in it, and their, their purpose is this, to overcome Satan, which I think is a great thing, but they claim they're going to usher in the kingdom and make the world ready for Christ's return. They're going to make it better and better and better. I don't think that jives with Scripture. I think Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, 37, that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get better as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be at the second coming of Christ. Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth. Now, this movement has a lot of good things that they're talking about. They want to take over the seven mountains of society. Now, I think we can impact the seven mountains of society, and we are to, as Christians, be engaged with these things I'm going to mention, but we're not taking them over. We're not taking them over. The seven mountains are this, family, government, education, media, entertainment, and business. And again, we must, as believers, impact, but in no way are we taking this over. Why do I say this? Am I crazy? Am I just bringing something out of left field? No. No. Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world system. World, world system three times. He's the ruler of this world. John 12, 31, 14, 30, and 16, 11. Paul calls Satan the God of this age. He has control of this world system. Don't ever think that, that Satan is not behind what you see in the media today, entertainment today, what's happening in families today, how the family has been degraded right before our eyes, and now we make things up like homosexual marriage, and that can be a family. No, this is not what God has ordained in his word. That's tragic that people are deceived in that way. It really is. It's, 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 it's a crying shame that the government has bought into this. Business has bought into this. Many churches have bought into this. This is tragic. This is tragic because people are blinded by their sin. And we must speak the truth. And when we do, 
You're a hater. You're a hater. The greatest love you can give anyone is telling them the truth and rescuing them from an eternity in hell. That's the greatest love you can give someone. So, contrary to Scripture, this is the whole apostolic reformation thing is contrary to Scripture that tells us that things are getting worse and worse and worse. They use the title apostle and prophet, and with that comes a lot of power. You have an apostle that's going to tell the churches how to run it, and they're going to have a lot of energy and influence in those churches. They often claim that God told me to tell you. I have a word from you from God, so listen to me. Folks, God has given us his word. This is our plumb line. Now, if someone tells me something that's in line with his word, great. But if someone's coming out from left field with a new revelation, and it's not in line with God's word, then I'm going, hold it, hold it. I'm not buying into this. I won't buy into that. So, apostles today, folks, are sent ones sent into the world with the message of Jesus. And by the way, who does that include? That includes all of us. We are all sent into the world with the message of Jesus. We are ambassadors of Christ. Remember, we are Christ ambassadors, and as his ambassadors, we represent him wherever we go. It starts in your family. I represent Jesus in the family. All your kids might not like that, but I represent Jesus in the family. Hopefully, you'll come along. At your workplace, you represent Jesus. In your recreation, in your hobbies. Remember, you're an ambassador of Christ. Where are you going with your hobbies? Where are you going? What are you doing in life? Remember, you're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever you're going, you're taking him. You're representing him. Apostles of the church, folks, listen to this, describes what the person does, not who the person is. See, apostles of Christ, that was who they were. That's who they were. But apostles of the church, this is what we do as we go into the world and engage our world. Now, let's talk about bond servants for just a second. Bond servants. What is this bond servant? And I wanted to talk about slave thing all about because of the awful connotation of slaves in our culture. No one wants to be a slave. We think of the awfulness of slave traders. Slaves as we know it, in this country in particular, were forced, ripped from their families, brutalized on slave ships and by their masters, and abused. Key word here is forced. Forced. And owning another human being, be enforcing them to serve is the worst of the... I didn't know if it was worse or worse, or worst or worst. So whatever it is, you can correct me, but it's the worst of all egregious things, of abuses. A bondservant of Christ is very, very, very different. They are not the same. A bondservant, a slave of Christ, listen to this, is voluntary... It is an honored position of service to our Lord. I willingly, see the Holy Spirit never forces us, never makes you. He will influence you. He will leverage pressure on you, but he doesn't make you. God never makes us love him. That's volitional. I willingly place myself under the Lord. Remember Hupotasso, I place myself under his authority. He is my Lord. He owns me. He directs me. He is my master. Now listen to this next thing. The difference is, my master loves me. Take a stop right there. Realize how much Jesus loves you. When we say that little song, Jesus loves me, this I know, that's, folks, that is the truth. For the Bible tells me so. God loves us immensely that he came here to be one of us to live amongst us. My master loves me. He cares for me. My master blesses me. And guess what? My master dies for me. My master gives his life for me. I owe my master everything. And you know what? I may be called to die for my master, as they are in Nigeria today when that poor church is suffering so violently. I want you to pause and think for just a second. And please 
please plant this in your memory banks. And I've mentioned this many times, so most of you get it. Every human, every little baby, every human born into this world are born slaves of Satan, their master. Every single person, whether that person knows it or not, that is the truth. Adam's sin has been imputed or credited to every human. We all have the sin gene, the sin curse. Well, the fall of man had huge consequences. All are slaves of Satan. All are enemies of God. Romans 5.10 says this. Now listen, this is the truth. For if when we were enemies, all of us are enemies of God until we were reconciled to God, how? Through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Reconciled means brought back into right relationship. We were estranged from Christ. We were in the kingdom of darkness. And now we're being brought back into the right relationship that we should have had with God before the fall. Right relationship. So, Jesus came to set the captives free. We're all captives until we're set free by our Lord. Galatians 5.1 in the NIV says this, It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Jesus freed us by dying for us, dying in our place, paying our sin debt. And everyone who believes this, remember believe, commit to. It's more than just mental assent. Commit to. Put your trust in Jesus as your sin bearer will be saved. I've said this many, many, many times. So, those who are really free, those who are really free are those who bow to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Salvation is a free gift. Those who do not want Jesus, and that's the majority of humanity. Remember, Jesus said the majority aren't going to follow him. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many, many go in by it. And narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who will find that gate. Few who want that gate. Those who do not want Jesus will continue to be slaves of their master, Satan. Folks, there's two choices. It just gets down to this. Jesus or Satan? Which kingdom are you going to serve? It gets right down to that. Now, thinking about bond servants in Scripture, the greatest bond servant of all was Jesus, is a bond servant in Philippians 2 7, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form, the morphe, of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus became one of us to save us. Now, other people in Scripture that are popular and very powerful in Scripture are Paul, a bond servant, Timothy, James, Peter, Jude. But by the way, you are called a bond servant. Listen what it says in 1 Corinthians 7 22. For he who called you in the Lord as a bond servant is a freed man in the Lord. You become a bond servant, you have been freed. Freed in the Lord. Calling all slaves of Satan, folks. Come to Jesus and be free. Free. Live as free people. Believers must consider themselves bond servants and slaves of Christ. When I say this, what does it actually mean to me? When I say Jesus is Lord, Master, Kurios, Master, Ruler, Owner of my life, that word Lord is not simply a tag. The Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord. It's not simply a tag. It means he owns me. I owe him everything. So when I say Jesus of Lord is Lord, it is personal. It is deeply personal into our spirits. I declare my allegiance to him alone. My allegiance is to Jesus Christ alone. Not all the gods of this world, not all the idols that are tugging me away. It is to Jesus alone. I declare to him that as a bondservant, I renounce all past masters in my life. Key word, renounce. I'll expound on it more in a second. 
As a bondservant, I give my life, my allegiance totally to Christ my Savior. And as a bondservant, I will have no other gods, little gods, controlling me. The Lord Jesus controls my life. Now, when I say the word renounce, that is a big deal. That is a big deal. I am out loud proclaiming the demonic realm who owned me at one time. And there were strongholds in my life because I belong to that kingdom. I'm making an announcement, proclaiming the demonic realm. I renounce all past strongholds. And I yield all of my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what are strongholds? I'm going to define this a couple times in this talk. A fortress, a prison, ways of thinking that are contrary to God. Now, what are they? They are well-worn tracks in our brain that we have accessed while we were in the kingdom of darkness that controlled our lives, controlled our thinking. Ways of thinking that dominate your being and control you. Now remember this, we've said this many, many times. He who controls the mind controls the person. That's why you have all of this indoctrination that is coming into children as young as kindergarten or preschool, having transgenders coming into their world and saying everything is great and wonderful. That indoctrination is starting with the kids. And remember, when a nation has given itself over to the gods of this world, the one that really wants the kids was Molech. Remember that? Molech. And he wants the children. And that's where abortion came in, a destruction of kids. They want you to change your view of the, what God made of a family and what right and wrong is. Ways of thinking that dominate you, strongholds. We must deal with strongholds. So, what would be examples of strongholds? Anger, lust, critical spirit, addictions of every sort. Many, many things that we justify in our lives over and over that the Spirit of God says, get rid of that. Well, that's, that, well, well Lord, you can't, I can get rid of all this, but I can't get rid of that. Get rid of that. If he is master, he asks you to get rid of the things that he tells you to get rid of. Don't justify your sweet spot sin. God convicts. Now again, strongholds, I'm going to repeat this. Ways of thinking deeply embedded in our mind, controlling our lives. Now, I have a picture of a brain. Picture of a brain. Now, in your brain, these are gyruses and sulcuses. Within here are tracks, ways of thinking. You think something and it's well-worn. I think that this sin is okay, boom, I go right there. I think this sin is okay, boom, I'm okay. I'm convicted, I go right here as examples. Well-worn pathways, strongholds that have to be overcome. Rationalizing is one of the best, not the best, it's the most destructive thing that humans do. I rationalize my sin. It's it's usually the go-to place for all of us. All of us. Think about this. One person said this, quote, There are a lot of things which will allow a stronghold to be built and fortified in our lives. It might be something that happened to us in the past, usually was, such as abuse or rejection. It could be when we have allowed the world's philosophies, remember that one? Philosophies of this world to take over. Things that you know are sin and you rationalize and the world tells you it's okay. It's okay. Or when we believe the lies of the enemy of our soul more than the great and precious promises of our God. End quote. Bond servants, whatever the origin, a spiritual stronghold will dampen your life, will not allow you to be all you can be in Christ. It will keep you at a certain level and not allow you to progress. We must give up the delusion that strongholds are overcome by our own willpower. I'm going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be angry today. I'm already angry. I'm not going to be angry today. I mean it. No. The Lord said to Zerubbabel, 
in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Zerubbabel had the mission of building the temple. Coming back from Babylonian captivity, it was the whole nation of Israel was a mess. And he thought, impossible, I can't do this. And then God speaks to the, this man. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You overcome, not by your might, not by your power, but God's power, says the Lord. We must deal with strongholds, folks, and not be controlled by them. Now, to overcome a stronghold, a person must dwell in Christ. Did you hear that? Make your home in Christ. You know the word men know. In other words, I stay connected to Jesus. It isn't, I'm in Jesus for a few minutes on Sunday morning, and then I forget him for the whole week, or I might tag on a little Jesus here or there. Man, where you're dwelling in him, he's part of your life. You're in his word daily, and you're in communication with him throughout your day. You're to pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all prayers and supplications. So, and then we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We demolish arguments. How? Dwelling in Christ. Spirit of God in me. I can't do this without the power of God. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Folks, we have the Holy Spirit. We have something the world does not have, a power source it does not have. And we can make a faith choice instead of a flesh choice. We can because of the Spirit's power within us. Now, Closing thoughts. I want you to think about this. Because so many people are trapped in their past. Some egregious thing that has happened to them. I mean, folks, we've all had abuses. Some greater, some not so great, but we've all had some. So who is your master? Let's start with that question. Who is your master? Who's ruling your life? We are all slaves of something or someone. Something or someone. Are you living as a slave to your past? Ask yourself the question. Some abuse, some unfairness that you never let go of. Some addiction. Some failure. Something I wish I never did or said, and I'm just kind of living that defeat land. Are those feelings controlling you, destroying your peace, robbing you of purpose? Are you self-medicating? Are you using alcohol? Are you using pot? Are you using drugs? Are you using food addictions? Are you using exercise addictions? Are you using any number of things other than God to, to, to tampen down that past pain? Is that what you're doing? Are you living in anger and you cannot shake the resentment? Are you living as a slave to fear, a slave to your feelings? How about this? Now, tell me about if this isn't the truth. I think all the other stuff was the truth, but listen to this one. Are you living in what-if land? What if? Oh, my goodness. What if Iran really unleashed and then Hezbollah unleashes? And oh, my goodness, and this, this whole thing starts and it's going to be terrible. Look, at Jesus is coming back. He's going to rescue us. He's rescuing us. Are you living in what-if land? What if the climate change is true? And all of a sudden, Florida's gone. You know, in 1990, Al Gore said Florida's going to be underwater. 2024, the beaches are still there. The coast on both sides of the country, still there. Hotels right next to the water, still there, still there. By the way, they want you to live in fear, guys. They want you to, the next pandemic. Oh, what if the next pandemic comes? And you already heard it. It's going to be worse than COVID. Oh, what if? What if? What if Iran gets nukes? What if radical Muslim cells are unleashed in this country? Folks, this is a reality. What if that lump, wherever it comes, what if that's, what if that's actually something? What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? Whether or not you know it or not, you are being call, controlled by a cruel master. His name is Satan, who wants you to live in what-if land. 
to stay right where you are, to never progress, to never move forward, to live in your past, the strongholds, keep them there. That's his goal for you. That's his goal. Paul had plenty of reasons to live in unfairness and the abuses of the past. Paul suffered much. Many people suffer much, but are not controlled by their past. Now listen to this statement. Don't fade on me right now. Listen to this statement. We must change from slave thinking to overcomer freed man thinking. How do we do this? You have to realize a few things. You have to come to grips with some reality here. I cannot control what happened in the past. That pain is real. I can't ignore that. That pain is real. I cannot control what is happening in our world. The constant mess we're living in, the daily stressors that you get. You are being bombarded like no one in the history of the world with information overload. And 99% of it is negative. I think I'm right on that. I've got it right. 99% negative. I cannot control how others respond to what is happening in the world. (gasps) That's all you hear. (gasps) Hey, we belong to Jesus. We know he's coming to rescue his church from the worst of the worst, but it doesn't mean we're going to get away from all of it, folks. Look at the church in Nigeria. For them, it's the end of the world. They're in tribulation. Look at the church in Iran, which is, by the way, is the fastest growing church in the world under persecution. Look at the church in North Korea. These people are going through things we cannot imagine. That's tribulation for them right now. But the global tribulation that comes, that's going to be worse than anything that's happening in this world now. I cannot control others respond to what's happening. The sky is falling, indoctrination. I cannot control someone else, nor do I want to. Impact them, yes, but I cannot control them. I cannot control them. What I can control is me. My response is in the now. Paul writing from a jail. Philippian, wrote to the Philippian church. It may be able to help us. Talks a lot about overcoming. It comes from Philippians chapter 3. Chapter, Philippians chapter 3 verse 8 says this, Paul, speaking on the abuse that he received from the Jewish leadership, which was profound. You heard the list. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Let that resonate within you. Knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage or rubbish that I may gain Christ. That word knowing is the word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. And that, that means to know experientially. I have experienced Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have personally given my life to Him. I share life with Jesus now all the time. Garbage. Remember, he's been through all this abuse and tragedies and all those perils of here and there. He considers that garbage, rubbish, manure, dung. All the stuff of life is secondary to knowing Christ. Why? All this is passing away. For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Folks, Jesus, Jesus is our power source. He is my peace source. He is the one that, my hope source. He's the one that changes my life, changes the course of everything. Jesus, I can't imagine, I can't emphasize this enough. He is the He is the answer for the disturbed souls. He's the answer for strongholds that that you still struggle with in your lives. All this stuff is secondary to knowing Him. I don't have to stay the same, folks. Paul crescendos in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His suffering, becoming like Him in His death, and somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. I want to know Jesus. A deep, personal relationship with Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 12, to press on. And then he emphasizes pressing on in verse 13 and 14. One thing I do. Put your name there. You want to have strongholds come down. You want to change your life. Not allow your past to control you. 
One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal to win the prize with God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I am not living in my past. I am moving forward. I am moving forward. Press on. That word means, that, that has some energy applied to it, folks. We're not pressing on by doing it this way. Oh, oh, I can't move. I, my past has just destroyed me. No, press on. Is, the Spirit of God fills me. I am energized, and I can say, I hated what happened back there, but I am moving forward. I'm not going to allow that to keep me in bondage my whole life. Now, the question is this. Ask your, answer these questions. Is Jesus really your master? Or is some event or someone in your past your master? Answer that question. Is Jesus really in control of your life? And thirdly, what master controls you when your foundations are shaken? What master controls you when all the strings on your rope have bursted? I have this little slide here. When you're down to one string, everything else has failed. You're holding on for dear life. Where do you go? Where do you go? That's a question. I think it's a legitimate question. Now, Chuck Swindoll gave a masterpiece. This was written probably in the 70s, early 80s. And I've shared this several times. For some of you, this will be familiar. Maybe this will be your first time. But it is Paganini and One String. And I'll read this to you, quote from Chuck. One evening, Niccolo Paganini, the famous 19th century Italian violinist, was performing before a packed house. As he played through a number of difficult pieces, one after another, his strings began to break on his violin. Amazingly, he finished the piece on one string. As expected, the audience jumped to their feet, clapping their hands, cheering loudly, never asking for an encore. He did such a tremendous job with the one string. Paganini, seizing the moment with a twinkle in his eye, a smile on his face, shouted, Paganini and one string, and he played the whole concerto over again on one string. Chuck goes on to say this. You may be wondering why I'm sharing this with the group of you today. It's simply because I've been in ministry long enough and heard enough stories to know the difficulty of life at any age. Everyday hardships can leave us feeling like we're down to one string. Tell me who hasn't been there. Tell me who hasn't been there. We are too focused on the three that have snapped. This can lead us to a sense of bitterness, sorrow, self-pity, and perhaps even blame. We feel incredibly frustrated that we don't have four strings like everybody else. However, we should never lose sight of knowing that we have the greatest string left, and that is our attitude. I thought it was great. He finishes this way. You can focus your life on three strings that dangle, or you can play your melody on one, and oh, the difference it makes. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the tick of the clock. We cannot change that we're moving toward death. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way and do certain things. We cannot change the inevitable. Those are strings that dangle. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that is our attitude. Life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I respond to it. And then he says, and so it is with you. Our attitude keeps us going or it cripples our progress. It alone fuels our fire or assaults our hopes. When our attitude is right, there is no barrier too high, no valley too deep, no dream too great, no challenge too tall. End quote. Folks, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Thank him for all he has done. Live as overcomers. Live as freed men and women. Free persons. Free persons. You know what a free person does? I can do 
all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's freed man thinking. Freed woman thinking. I can let the past go and press on towards the upward calling of God. I can do that. Who is your master? Who is your master? Something in your past, a problem, an issue, abuse, disappointments? Who is your master? Hopefully you can say with vigor, with vigor, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to indelibly put this last slide in your minds before we leave. Who is your master? Jesus. Kurios. Master. Ruler. Owner. My master loves me. My master cares for me. My master gives me hope. My master died for me. I owe my master everything. Hopefully you can say that with your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that you've allowed us to live as free people. We don't have to be bound by our past. We don't have to be bound by the disappointments of the past. We don't have to be bound by the worry and anxiety that comes into our lives and waves. But we can live as free people and say, Lord, no matter what happens, I trust you. And as Richard Farmer said, those great words, I will trust in the Lord until I die. That's where I'm going to put my trust. May the strongholds come down in your life. May the Lord Jesus be exalted in every life here. Thank you for this time that you've given us the study, the inerrant, infallible word of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen.